So we're delighted to have Smita Singha joining us this evening to deliver the first short provocation in reference to the Architecture Fringe 2021 theme of unlearning. Tonight she will be delivering a short presentation with the title Climate, Colonialism and Context. There will be an opportunity for five to ten minutes of questions at the end of Smita's presentation, so send them in to chat and um, send them to everybody so that we can all see them. There might be like some uh, common questions there. It might be about your reflections from what she's saying or just a question for herself. Um, and we would invite you to ask the question at the end, so I'll just pick out some from, from that chat function. Um, Samita is an award-winning architect, academic, author with her own design practice, Ecologic, which has worked internationally. Samita's successful career started early with the UIA UNESCO International Design Award for her thesis, on the back of which she received a Cambridge University Scholarship in Sustainable Design. Her other awards include the Women in Business Award at the House of Commons and Atkins Inspire Award for Architecture. Samita set up Architects for Change, the Equality Forum at the Royal Institute of British Architects, and is past chair of Women in Architecture. She was elected to the RIBA Council, has served on many RIBA committees over the past 25 years, and this year, as I'm sure many of you know, she ran an election for president of the Institute. Samita has taught architecture in the UK and abroad. Presently, she is a tutor in professional practice at the University of Westminster. She is the founding director of Chara Shilla, an international design charity for community projects. And she is the author of many books, including Architecture for Rapid Change and Scarce Resources, Autotelic Architect and Women in Architecture. Um, so just a reminder, send your questions into the chat. Um, can I also remind you just to remain muted? I'm sure you all know this by now. Um, and without further ado, I'll hand over to Samika, if someone can share her slides. Thanks very much, Shana, for the introduction. Um, yeah, so you you know about me. I'm not going to say any more, but I also have a, a connection with health that I'm a non-exec director at um, in in an NHS trust. So uh, <clears throat> I will be bringing that into the presentation uh, as well. So I'm I'm very very pleased to be here because Scotland is uh, one of my favourite places in the planet. When I got married, I brought my husband to Scotland for a honeymoon <laughs> and we traveled around Scotland because I was so um, happy to be there. And I, any, any chance to come to Scotland, I you know, take it. Um, so today's talk is about climate, colonialism and context. And um, you know, we have the situation where the climate crisis, inequality and disruptive changes to the profession, COVID-19, everything's going on. It seems that, you know, I think someone said, you know, the, the floor was sort of shaking, moving the world's um, upside down. So we as a profession, we are in a state of flux. And um, we as architects, I'm sure all of you know, there, there are several ways of, of dealing with this. We know about, uh, and they all start with R, so it's about reusing, retrofit, reducing, recovery, recycling, and repurposing. So all the R's we, we know about, and especially with your uh, background in, in, in Archifringe, you, you would know all that, so I'm not here to talk about that. Um, and also Scotland is, is further in its intention than many other um, nations and including those in the UK. So we, you've had your zero waste policy from 2010, so it's 10 years old now. And you also set an ambitious target to become net zero by 2045 with 75% reduction in your greenhouse gases by 2030. So I think that's, that's really, really encouraging as well. So I'm not going to talk to the, you know, converted about all those sort of issues. Um, today, I want to bring a perspective, a global perspective and a perspective from where I come from, which is India, uh, and talk to you about that as a provocation to see how you as architects, how you as citizens can actually do something about it. Um, so I want to propose that um, that uh, from colonized nations and uh, those who uh, they have uh, issues still arising from being colonized. 
I want to propose that climate crisis, sustainable development and colonization have a linked history, hence the title of my presentation. Um, so also you'll see, hopefully the provocation will lead you on to group discussions where you can see there could be multiple uh, ways of dealing with the situation uh, and uh, the pro problems and solutions might be perceived differently uh, by different people. Um, and unfortunately, build, the building industry continues to have um, a, a link with the climate crisis, as you all know, and with colonial practices from a long time back. So um, I'm going to start with the first slide, please. Okay. So the first slide, uh, the slide here is about disconnection. And, and you know this, the fact that where things are being produced is so disconnected from the user. And this is a result of not having a circular economy, but having a linear economy. And the problem with a linear economy is that it's not, not, not a natural way of doing things. So in nature, things are, things are produced and they're actually uh, go back as, as fertilizer or um, into the air or water and they do something else which feed back. And so there's a circular uh, way of that nature functions which doesn't happen with our linear way of producing things. We started from um, the industrial revolution. Now, there are two aspects as well to this. The first is that the waste produced it's not very easy to um, deal with the waste uh, produced with the linear economy because you are so disconnected you actually don't see the waste so the construction industry is the uk's biggest uh, consumer of natural resources so 400 million tons of material each year um, results in 100 million uh, tons of waste being produced so it's one fourth of the, the amount actually goes into landfill or is unusable. Um, and so that, that's not a linear economy. You have a situation where you know, you're actually extracting something from the land and that's ending up becoming waste. The other thing the linear system does is obviously this disconnection between the land and the user. So you don't see what happens. So a lot of the waste that we produce um, from construction, from different places, even medical waste ends up in places like Turkey and Vietnam, Malaysia, Taiwan, and we, we don't see that. It's just, you know, you put it in the recycling bin and off it goes. You don't know where it, where, what's happening to it. And I think there was one point where um, there was some investigation and they found medical waste uh, from the UK uh, lying in, in Turkey. So this kind of disconnection has to stop in, in order for us to um, be able to uh, design sustainably. Uh, next slide, please. So there, with, with colonization, you actually see, um, or you grew up with a narrative or a history that um, you're pr probably not familiar with. So there are things that we saw in the colonies that you didn't see and there are things I come here and see. So the first um, slide, the first picture is uh, the VE Day celebrations in 1945. And uh, those were being shown in all these uh, various channels um, uh, some time back uh, when we were celebrating VE Day uh, recently. And, but what is not being shown is that uh, more than 3 million Bengalis died in the Bengal famine. And that is the picture. That's one of the really sad pictures of bodies lying in the street being eaten by vultures. And I'm sorry, I'm having to show this because this is a picture that you don't see because food was taken away from Bengal in order to feed the armies that were fighting. And this only happened in Bengal didn't happen in the neighboring part of Burma, for example, because, or it's called Myanmar now, but it didn't happen there because the food distribution was different um, there. But it was taken from these people in order to feed the people that were fighting the war. Then um, Bengal was one state that was partitioned twice. 
Um, so first it was partitioned, then it was united, and then it was partitioned again. And the final partition in 1947 meant that 10 million Indians were displaced and one bit of it eventually became Bangladesh um, and the other bit became Pakistan. And then more than a million Indians died during the final partition in 1947. Um, so th these are things that we don't consider and we don't see how it is related to the construction industry. But if you want to, um, you know, if you want to have a global overview, if you want to see the historical narrative that is being produced for you, you need to go beyond what you're actually seeing. You need to see the unseen. Next slide, please. So what you see is what we call development. So this is in London. Um, on, on the screen, you'll see it on the left which is the Nine Elms development with all the concrete and lovely buildings coming up for housing. And what you don't see is what you see on the right of the screen, which is, um, which is taken from my village. So you have this lovely sand where I used to play as a child, that's all gone. It's all gone. You can see how much sand has been taken from the entire length of the river and people have this broken bamboo bridge they don't even have a bridge to cross the river anymore and this this photo was taken i took it last year um, during the monsoons next please so um on the left you see um the sort of stuff that is being proposed for cpd by the riba so you you have glass cladding being proposed and it looks really nice, maybe. And um, then on the other hand, what you don't see is the air conditioning that's needed for these glazed buildings. Next slide, please. So often inequality is actually visible from the air. And this is a city I worked in quite a bit. This is Caracas. And you can see the motorway and how it actually neatly divides the the slum areas, the barriers from the so-called middle-class areas with all these concrete skyscrapers. And uh, people who are on the motorway, they don't actually interact. The motorway actually separates um, the two parts of the city. And, and this is, again, a policy from uh, the colonial times where, the, where Caracas was designed as a, uh, from the principles of design of Paris. And this city grew and grew and then these people came in to work in the city and they had nowhere to live. So they lived on these little hillocks next to the city and um, these slums actually have more people living in them than the houses uh, facing them. And I wrote about inequality in my book, Architects for Rapid Change and Scarce Resources, which is a subject I was teaching at one point. And, um, you know, you're welcome to read more, but this is a subject I've explored a lot. Next, please. So one way of removing inequality is to have common goals. And the, these were the sustainable development goals um, produced by the United Nations. And they were also produced in 2010. And there are 17 of these. So, um, the, the, you can see that some of them perhaps on um, reading that doesn't relate to architecture. So for example, one, um, two, maybe hunger, they have no connection with architecture. But um, my provocation is that they do have a connection with architecture and design. Is how we design cities. Um, are we providing good health? Are we providing areas where people can grow stuff? Are we um, you know, designing areas so that everyone lives in, in clean and pollution free environment. Um, and so I was a bit disappointed that uh, the RIBA Sustainable Outcomes Guide, which was produced in 2019, uh, does not include eight of these 17 goals. So they've um, taken out one, two, four, five. Uh, I don't know how they took out gender equality, but they did. Um, and they taken out 10 and uh, 14, 16 and 17. 
And, and I think partnership, working and engagement with people is so important. Um, and it, again, 16, peace is so important for building cities that I, again, you know, a lot of this is all related. And one of the issues with, um, one of the things I do with healthcare is to try and relate sustainable development goals with the World Health Organization's constitution. Um, so they've, um, the World Health Organization says that it's the state's duty to provide, the, to provide for the underlying determinants of health, such as clean water, sanitation, food, housing, and health-related information, education, and gender equality. So it, healthcare is not just about provision of hospitals, equipment, medical medicine, medical staff, but it's linked to the design of cities. So in some ways, what I'm saying, another provocation is that all architects are actually designing healthcare into whatever they design. Whenever you're thinking about sustainable um, living, sustainable design, you're also thinking about healthy cities. Um, next, please. So I'll present now a series of maps that I've been looking at, and I'm not at the end of it. This is sort of the beginning of it. So if you look at colonization map, which is on your left, of the screen. So this is how the world was in 1945 during the V Day celebration. So a lot of the countries were still under um, UK rule. I think at one point the UK had two thirds of the globe that was under its um, um, control one way or the other. So um, you can see the other countries, probably France maybe next uh, big, um, uh, you know, another country that has big, big um, uh, colon, colon, colonies, and then others like Portugal, Netherlands, etc. But there, um, and then you go to the other map, which is the GDP, which is from 2014. You see that in in 70 years, that the countries generally where um, independence was achieved uh, in, in that time, in that period, in the 1940s, um, they all not done so well in terms of their economic growth. But obviously economic growth isn't the be all of everything, but in terms of per capita wealth, they haven't done well. You look at the whole of Africa, which is um, you know on, in the light blue zone, you look at places like India, etc. Places like Canada and the United States, uh, the Gulf countries and European countries have done well. Again, you see the Southern European countries haven't done too well and Russia is um, sort of there, halfway there as well. So um, you, you begin to think, did that have an effect on the development of these places? Next slide, please. So if you look at the sustainable development goals and the climate crisis, again, you see this is the dashboard as of last year, 2019. So again, you see a pattern where a large part of Africa hasn't reached the goals. And then you have the richer countries which are almost there. So you can see Norway here. I don't know if I can, um, am I sharing my screen? No, maybe not, but um, you can see you know, where we are. And even surprisingly, the United Kingdom with its in inequal um, amounts of um, development around the country, this is still not reaching the um, goals of the sustainable development. And um, the other thing you don't see on the map is obviously within countries. So you have places like Brazil and Australia, which have internal in inequalities. So you've got um, people um, who are facing problems, especially the indigenous uh, populations that are being affected um, through lack of healthcare, through the fact that recently there's been forest fires in both countries and uh, through COVID at the moment. And, and this is where we need to think very carefully, you know, what, where's our wood coming from? What are we doing? And if you look at the climate crisis, again, you see that um, the, there's been temperature changes in almost everywhere. Um, and, you know, the rich countries and the poor countries, but the poor, looking at the dashboard of the sustainable development goals, we see that the rich countries have managed to 
um, recover faster or actually benefiting uh, from economic growth. Next, please. So, and, and this slide I've called imposition. I don't know if you've seen this picture, which went viral a couple of days ago. It shows a Komodo dragon facing off a, a truck. And this truck is bringing in reinforcement and they want to build a Disney style, I think it was called a Jurassic, a Jurassic Park in this space, which has been cleared up and um, which used to be full of trees. So um, what we are seeing here is um, uh, of values, imposition of Western values, which is um, we've got cultural, architectural, intellectual values. So um, I was watching this um, um, class, which, uh, which was um, um, this, this university, which was looking at, um, what were they looking at? Oh, how Western narrative, uh, and, and they were looking at, looking to explore non-Eurocentric narratives in the study of architecture but they used the European examples and the canon to explain the context. So again, all our values, architectural, as well as intellectual values are coming from the West. When, even when we go, because this, this, uh, this group had gone to Africa, to a particular country, to look at the systems of architecture and systems of um, designing places, but they'd come back and we're connecting Western values with what was happening in Africa. Then order is, is uh, reinforced by having conditional aid, selective import and exports. We clearing off forests to uh, produce um, things like um, avocados and quinoa, which are very destructive to the landscape and to the ecology of the place, because we think these are healthy stuff to have and we want to have them here. Conditional aid is like, okay, you do this for me and I'll do this for you kind of thing, which actually doesn't help. We want to actually hear what kind of development we need. And then we have the historical stuff, which I've talked about, which is about invasion, colonization and slavery. And then there is the nimbyism, which again, I talked about, which is dumping of waste, offsetting of carbon. So Norway does that, you know, it's got its electric cars, but how is it producing all this electricity and how is it offsetting um, its electricity um, production with what it's doing, uh, you know, by offsetting it by saying, well, we're doing this in other countries and we are actually uh, transporting stuff to this. So it's, it's all about sort of this kind of nimbyism in uh, construction and energy use. And then you have the exploitation, continuing exploitation of natural and human resources. Um, so for the example, the Arctic is melting, but the countries are more worried about the extraction of minerals and rare metals that are coming up now. Uh, and we need them, obviously we need them for our mobile phones. So these, these four or uh, five things, if you can look at that in your provocation and discuss them more, how, how can we as architects actually um, look at this and maybe do things differently? You cannot change history, obviously, but what do you do with this perspective? Do you think architects have a role to play in this? Or you think this is like the RIBA has concluded that some of the SDGs have nothing to do with architecture? So um, I'll, end, I'll end here, happy to take questions now. Um, if people can send through some questions into the chat, that'd be great. Uh, I, for, I think in the first instance, Samita, I wonder if you could elaborate maybe on how, what actions individual citizens could take. Okay, <laughs> so um, what, what I was, um, what we can do is actually we can educate ourselves. So the things we don't know about, we need to know about those and look at it more deeply and actually look at where everything is being produced. So for example, with plywood production, a lot of the um, plywood comes from China, but the plywood is actually being manufactured in China. It's not, so the wood is coming from elsewhere into China and put together as plywood and then being exported to European countries. So 
have a look at where the wood is coming from. That requires a more deep thinking. And if we're not thinking deeply about these issues, we are going to come up, come up against uh, barriers about um, you know, how we can actually change the situation. So educate yourself, look more deeply, and talk to other people, you know, talk to people uh, from other places. You know, the internet is great. You can do searches, you can actually have connections. So recently I made a connection with somebody from the US and uh, while uh, CLT is being touted as a great thing, he actually gave me a different perspective on CLT and how it's manufactured and where the wood comes from. So I now have a different view. I have more knowledge about CLT. So I might not be using it for everything. I might use it for some things, but not everything. So those three things can be done quite easily. Okay. Um, I have a question from Andrew Campbell. I don't know if you want to ask it yourself, if you want to unmute. Just a pretty basic question, but <laughs> how do we preach to the unconverted? Um, yeah, I, I, that's a great question. You know, how do we preach to the unconverted or to the people who are not part of unlearning or unfringing or whatever? <laughs> so um, I think we, I think you have a very strong voice and particularly, you know, the younger people have a very strong voice. So I think we need to use that voice and say, hang on, we need to do the things differently. And that's why this uh, presentation from the School of Architecture actually was very disappointing. The fact that they'd gone to Africa, um, actually seen what was happening and they were coming back and discussing this uh, in, in a, as if they'd never been to Africa. So um, I think we need, we need to talk more. We need to have dialogue and discussion about it. So that's how we preach. Um, I think I can read this. Um, so Anita, do you want to ask the question yourself? Uh, hello, hello. Uh, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Always I learn many things from you. So um, in terms of decolonization, I think uh, the transnational solidarity, which means the mutual uh, support from different country, uh, that that can be helpful. So, so in this context, diversifying education and recognizing others' work is uh, very much important. And uh, I, uh, so, I think how we can we can proceed in this direction. Absolutely, uh, I think it's a shame that you know. We're now 2020 and we've got a system of education that's based on 1950s. And in fact, you know, the RIBA is called uh, British, um, British Architects, you know, it's got that in it. And actually we're far more international. The RIBA has got like um, architects from 115 countries and we don't acknowledge that. We don't actually have, we have a great diversity of uh, membership and we don't learn from each other. So um, one of the things I said during my campaign was to have a digital platform where we're actually communicating and learning from each other. And I, I think we, we need to have that diversity in um, learning and, um, in, in, and, and that's gonna also help with creativity because the more diverse yes. we are, we're more uh, creative as well. So an and architectural education definitely has to change. Thank you. So, uh, I just wanted to add to what uh, Smita you just said. So I came from India and I found it very difficult. You know, I had to register for part one, part two, part three to be called an architect. And when I spoke to my head of the department in back in India, that why don't you have an affiliation with Reba? And why don't you have a recognition? This was his plain and simple answer. I say, he, they said that why do we need RIBA? to recognize us because they don't even have a, you know, they're the British architects. Yeah. So the name itself isolates us. Yeah. So we will never approach so and, and we when come here, we have to struggle for recognition. So even if, even if I want to appear for say two exams or three exam in a row, that is not possible. I need to appear for part one, part two and part three. 
so there are there are many many uh, inclusion issues and seriously i don't feel part of it because i am not a member and and most of the time i also found it very funny because riba is running events and in which architects are telling architects how to do architecture and why would you charge your own members a ticket for that event when they have already paid you membership fees and on the other side it, it is just a zoom one hour chat a presentation so architects teaching architects and they paying for it it's absolutely <laughs> i don't understand it doesn't make sense to me so how we, when why will we not change and when will we change so even if your very important message it has come through architecture french and that is that is one such a nice voice i have been following it for last 4 5 years now this is such an open platform where you could actually come and talk about it and receive so thank you very much architecture french thank you thank you i i don't know who you are but thank you very much for your <laughs> <laughs> no no uh, uh, my name is akash oh, so, oh sorry my camera is off sorry yeah i'm akash <laughs> sorry i didn't thank realize you. thank yeah. you for that um yeah so i i think uh, when i came from india the school of architecture was actually rib validated but um so that's why i did my part 1 and part 2 in india and then came here and i could do my part 3 here but unfortunately um no school in india is affiliated with the rib anymore and i i think people want to do their own thing and unless the syllabus is changed which actually appeals to all these 115 countries or countries become like a federation they have their own rules this this is not going to change but I, anyway i'm not here to discuss rib yes, policy that's right so that's right. <laughs> Uh, but this is my personal feeling so this is a personal opinion so please um, don't quote me on it no no